Yes. Hello, I'm Benjamin Meisel. Here are all my appropriate social medias. They will be on the end if you miss them. Yes, I do consider GitHub a social media. If you disagree, I refer you to my blog post on the topic. So, so this is Tales of C, the 6502, and, B, and the BBC. With added Python, because Python is awesome. Possibly blasphemous at a C conference. <laughs> also, warning, some of you may have a nostalgia overload. Um, so, first thing I'd like to point out, if it's not blatantly obvious, I'm not from the 80s. But I will be talking about the topic from the 80s and trying to appear as if I was from the 80s. So, <laughs> we uh, must start by going back to the 80s. Uh, and it all starts with the BBC, with 80s appropriate logo. So, in the 80s, they had the Computer Literacy Project, which is rather boringly titled here. But the idea was they realized computers were becoming a thing, and they wanted to teach kids through the medium of television all about computers. But because the uh, BBC was being the good kid, they didn't want to pick a specific computer. So they launched a competition in classic capitalist form to find the best computer possible. And Acorn won the contract. Uh, right, I have a lot to go on here. Uh, and it did include a lot of history about how this was made, but there's a rather hilarious anecdote. They were working on what they called the Acorn Proton, and uh, it was semi-working. They phoned up the BBC saying, we have a computer that fits your needs. Uh, they said, great, we'll be around on Friday. So it was Monday. So they designed half the computer in a week. <laughs> so it's a pretty impressive uh, computer for what it was. Uh, so it supports floppy drive, hard drive. Yes, they were expensive as you'd expect them to be. Uh, analog to digital converter, GPIO, parallel printer, speech, interrupts and timers, 16 colors, and even a second processor. And um, I believe you could, either, you could even get a VGA size screen in only to one kilobyte of RAM by using Teletext. Um, a 6502 processor and runs BBC Basic, uh, which conveniently has a built-in assembler, which will be a big topic, uh, of, well, big topic of this talk. Uh, BBC Basic is similar to Microsoft Basic, but with a few weird oddities, as every single version of Basic is all different. Um, but I got bored of it because I didn't like it. It wasn't nicely laid out. I couldn't write functions. Well, I could, but they were very horrible functions. It was sort of like a jump and then a jump back. Um, and yeah, probably due to my liking of Python. So instead, I learned to use the assembler. And this is all the 6502 assembly instructions. I counted 53, although someone did say 55 yesterday. I'm not sure. Um, and it may look like there's a lot, but if you consider the amount of instructions available to you on the x86 computer, that is between 500 and 5,000, depending on how you count. Um, it may look uh, daunting, but if you understand the general mappings from the higher level concepts to assembly, it's fine. So here is an example of an if passing. We are comparing 42, the magic number of everything, to 44. Um, so we load A with the literal value 42. Note, actually, that's hex 42, so that not 42. Uh, notice the dollar sign to signify hex. Compare with hex 44, branch on minus to here, and then you do the, do the code, and then jump past the else statement to the end, uh, and then rest of the program. And if it fails, the branch or minus does not branch, then you jump past the true statement to the else and then continue with the program. Uh, so at this point, something wasn't quite right in my mind. And if you actually read the title of the talk or talk to me, you can probably guess what it was. I thought I could write a C compiler for this with no prior knowledge of anything related to compilers. No. You do not know how long it took me to get that meme to work in Google Slides. <laughs> so, how does one write a compiler? This is something that's taken me way too long to learn because I couldn't be bothered to buy a book and just Google it. I should have bought a book. <laughs> Those of you with a particular love of diagrams, this bit's for you. So, how I started out was a compiler. <laughs> A compiler is a black box. I should have made that arrow black, but it's a very dark <laughs> blue background, so um, that turns C code or other code into assembly code. Um, 
So there are some other things going on in that. <laughs> it doesn't immediately go from C to assembly, uh, such as Alexa, parser, abstract, syntax tree, intermediate language, register allocator, all of that. Uh, so step one, Alexa. This is possibly the most simple bit. Uh, it will turn this very simple C function into a list of tokens. Um, you may notice most of these have redundant values, such as, yes, we know it's an integer, so it's already got that in there, but I use it for errors. Don't try and use this compiler for, with, any, uh, with any bad code, because the errors are awful. It will just throw syntax error, and then you have to go up and look up the line number and then go into the source of the compiler to figure out which line threw that syntax error. <laughs> <laughs> but some of the values are useful, like an integer and then the actual integer value. Um, so step two, a parser and abstract syntax tree. This is the bit that took me the longest. Uh, so what does it do? It turns these tokens into a tree. I know this isn't very tree form, but you get the idea. Uh, this is how it's printed out when you turn on debugging. Um, and this is the representation of the program abstractly without containing any of the original program. And it can be stepped through from going down the left-hand side, then back up, then right-hand side, then back up again to generate the intermediate code. Um, and no, it has nothing to do with hyperactive sugary trees that do things for you. <laughs> um, so this is implemented by having each node as a Python class, and then uh, they're more like data classes, and then they store the then leaf nodes, well, they store the nodes underneath them as parameters, and some of them have functions. For example, there's a whole other tree for C declarations and declaration types that has an entire function on it to generate this C type here, which is, uh, I will not explain that. It's complicated, and I admittedly just copied the code from someone else because I did not understand it. Uh, so there's, there's uh, what, 670 lines that define all the possible nodes and functions on the nodes, and 654 that pass all of that. So it's not the most comprehensive C parser. It can't handle array initialization or structures or unions or any of that fancy stuff, but it's simple C programs it can handle. Uh, so you may notice some of these things can already be converted directly to assembly, such as the number that can be converted to a literal load and a plus that can be converted to an add, uh, that's about it. <laughs> uh, so here's some actual assembly. This is the output assembly for that program. Um, so ignore from here to here, that's my very simple libc implementation that has <laughs> put char and get char. <laughs> uh, then we have some routines here because I had to implement a custom stack because you cannot do stack relative addressing on the 6502, uh, so I had to do that myself. Uh, da, 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 da. Then we, there's setup globals, but there's nothing there. So then this is the start function. Uh, sets up the stack pointer and then jumps to setup global, uh, calls main, and then main here, loads A with one, add carry two, store A in seven one, and then, because all integers are 16 bits, it does the high bit as well and 7170 are the virtual return register in zero page. Uh, and then jump back here, return, and then there's some set, uh, basic at the end that just calls start and then prints out the value in the high and low return register. So, demo time, or it would be if I could SSH into a BBC Micro. Hang on, scrap that. Yes, I can SSH into a BBC Micro. SSH into a what? Nice and terror bang, I think. <laughs> so I did figure out how to SSH into a BBC Micro. It is rather convoluted. So there is the BBC Micro has a serial port which can be used as a remote terminal. Then there is an old Windows XP computer screw to the top of it that has a serial port on it, and it's running a program that converts from Telnet to serial, which I had to write myself because I could not find one. I also probably overcomplicated the program by uh, supporting multiple serial uh, sessions at once, so you could have multiple people log into it, and then it will all go out of the same serial port. <laughs> I can only imagine the fun you could have with that. Then there is a Linux VM on my server at home that convert the USSH into, and then it starts the Telnet session. So, oddly enough, it worked after about a week of effort. Um, 
and let's see if I can pull up a terminal and actually do this. Uh, right, is that, no, control, yes, right, big account. Uh, yep, in. Yeah, oh, no, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I did it wrong. There. No, do I have caps lock on? What's it doing? Oh. There. <laughs> At least the demo works. So we can see if we list the disk contents that there is, so there is a program to add one and two, but I've put one that multiplies three and 10 and pre-compiles it to machine code. So if we load, uh, what am I doing? Oh. <laughs> uh, yes, that worked. and then list it, that's all, yeah, that's a lot. Um, most of it is actually a 16-bit multiplication routine I had to write, and it's probably more complicated than it should be because it can support arbitrary length integers. Uh, so you can... <laughs> <laughs> and the integer length is defined at compile time, so it doesn't do any fanciness. It's just more code is generated at compile time for longer integers. Um, but then if I... Run. This is technically a just-in-time compiler, might I add, because it compiles it, then immediately runs it. And there we go, 1E, 30 in hex. And that is just the address of start. Uh, on their new versions, that actually prints out the start address of the, where it's put the assembly and then the end address and also the address to jump to to run it so that I can save the compiled version out to disk. And yes, this technically has address space layout randomization because it dimensions a block with, uh, of memory with basic every time you compile it. <laughs> so uh, it's, although it's only layout randomization or at assemble uh, time. So one final thing, how do variables work? Yes, those pesky things which you all love to use and now I hate, at least in the context of compilers. So we have a symbol table. Um, and you may, and you would have a token of type identifier that you would then, and so there's two passes on the syntax tree, one to generate the symbol table and then one to interpret it. Uh, and uh, da, da, da. so this is a diagram and we can see the variable name, the type, uh, and then its location in memory. This is only for global variables, might I add. It's even more complicated for local variables. I will get to that in the next slide. But as you can see, it starts at 2FA, and then it increments by the size of the uh, variable type. Uh, so for example, that increments by 2, increments by 1, um, increments by 2 times 4, increments by 3, and then the next one will be incremented by 2 again. Uh, so, and it's even more complicated because if you want to do recursive functions, you can't just write to a static memory location because then if you call the function again within the same function or call the function multiple times, it will overwrite the uh, value and that's not what you want to happen. You want each function to have its own stack frame. Uh, so it's relative to the stack point, which of course, if you remember all the way back here, I had my custom stack and stack pointer just to implement that pointer relative addressing. Um, and with that, I come to an end. And this is my current understanding of how compilers work. <laughs> Ah, right, I have a few questions. You stated it has 16 colors, wasn't it? Eight colors and eight flashing modes. Yes, that is correct, but I, whatever. <laughs> it's technically 16. And 
BBC Basic was the single most modern language. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is true. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> you, well, yes. So I also love ages when computers, so I was wondering how you got into it. Uh, um, so you're asking, uh, you love 80s home computers and you're wondering how I got into this. It's a funny story um, in which I spend way too much time on YouTube, find out about one of these and then want one, and then it just so happens that uh, an old business is throwing out a load of what they consider rubbish, and I noticed one of these in here with the dot matrix printer and floppy drive, uh, and I said, can I have that? I'm like, sure. You're a bit weird for wanting that, but sure, and took it home. And that's how I have one. <laughs> yes? When are you planning on writing a Python compiler for it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when am I planning on writing on the Python compiler for it? Probably never. I am planning on porting Unix to it. Unix has been ported to the Z80, so it's not entirely unfeasible. But once, <laughs> uh, but the, yes, my, the compiler was intended to take a lot less time than this. I've spent about a year on it so far, and only two weeks ago I got recursive functions working. So uh, if I, I don't think I have the Fibonacci sequence program stored on my BBC Micro. I think it's on the emulator on my Mac. Um, but I have managed to get it to compute the Fibonacci sequence up to, I think I tested the 20th number, which took a really long time. <laughs> oh, so the question was, just so you can all feel completely inadequate, how old am I? I'm 15. <laughs> Uh, I am 16 in October. Let's keep it Any other questions? Anyone have any idea what I even just said? <laughs> yes. Do you want to help me retarget LLVM from my home group 6809? So, I didn't quite understand that question, but I, I think it was would it have been a better idea to retarget LLVM to this? Kind of. That yes. <laughs> well, my original plan was that, but because I had no idea about how compilers worked, I looked at the documentation and thought, oh my god, what is this? And then thought it would just be simpler to write a compiler myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, the question was, well, statement, <laughs> yes, that uh, someone has been working on cross-compiling from x86 assembler to Commodore 64 assembler, which also has a 6502 processor, and would I consider looking into that? And the, question, and the answer is yes. Um, they might give me some pointers about how to implement them things in my compiler, but I do intend to generate native 6502 assembler and not some other assembly language and then cross-compile that with another tool, because I want to know about everything in a compiler. This has sort of turned into a more of a learning experience than a purely functional tool. Yeah. Any more, any more? No? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.